So I want to get right to our drosh today, which is a continuation of the Gospel of Ezekiel, which today's title, the Gospel of Ezekiel, Sanctifying the Name. So we're talking today about what it means to sanctify the name of Hashem, the name of God, the name of Adonai, to sanctify the name and what that looks like. And we're going to get into some interesting topics tonight. today. We're going to possibly confront some uh, theology that you may have that, that you may still be holding on to um, from maybe from, you know, religions past. We'll look at that and see. We're also going to be talking about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, sometimes known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We'll be looking at the story of these three and get the backstory. And I think it's going to be fun for you when I get into this from the Midrash of Shir HaShirim, Song of Songs, because sometimes we see we think about biblical characters and we don't think about the fact that, that many of them all lived at the same time and all knew each other. And so we're going to be talking about that, about how Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's their actual names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is what the Babylonians call them. But we're going to look at their backstory. How does it relate to this topic? We're going to be looking at today Ezekiel chapter 20 as we talk about the sanctification of the name of God. So let me say our bracha. I want to get get right to this because I don't want to belabor this but I want to get right to it because there are some really interesting things we want to share today. So blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Adonai. Please, Adonai, our God, sweeten the words you have taught in our mouth, from the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Adonai, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. Amen. So the commentary to the book of Ezekiel chapter 20 begins with the statement that in this chapter, God is revealing to Ezekiel that the underlying purpose, the prime motivator, the prime mission of Knesset Israel, which is the assembly of Israel, the community of Israel, Knesset literally means assembly, The word synagogue is actually a Greek name. In Israel, a synagogue can be called a synagogue. It's not bad to call it a synagogue. But you'll notice in Hebrew, it's Beit Knesset, the house of assembly. And that's what the word synagogue literally means. We refer to the synagogue uh, colloquially as, as shul. That's a short word. That actually comes from the Yiddish. And it means a school, a shul, a place of learning. So the synagogue is a Beit Knesset, house of assembly. It's a Beit Midrash. It's a a place of of study. And you could say it's also a Beit Tefillah, meaning a place of prayer. Okay? So, but Israel as a community, a Beit Knesset, Israel, our mission is to be a Kedush Shem Shemayim, a sanctification of the name of God. That's our ultimate purpose. And the commentary goes on to explain that when we were in Egypt, we failed in this mission, but then again, we weren't, we were subjugated to Egypt, and we were, we were isolated, so to speak, within Egypt, but we still failed. Instead of, instead of being in Egypt and changing the culture of Egypt, we allowed Egypt to change us. As the sages say, when we came out of Egypt, we were all idol- idolaters. We had chosen to embrace the Egyptian culture. Then we went into the wilderness. We didn't have any negative influences. We were all alone. It was just us and Hashem. There was no other nation. Yes, there were Gentiles who came out of Egypt with us, but they all became Jews at Mount Sinai. You'll notice, by the way, that the mixed multitude is never again mentioned after, after Sinai. Why? Because they all converted and became Jews. After Sinai, it was just the children of Israel. That's the only people who were in the wilderness. So, but we still failed. And then when we became a nation in our own homeland, we were surrounded by nations. And I love how it says here, there's a one insight. I forget the term that's used in the Hebrew. I'm, I'm, oh, here it is. We were in the Midbar Ha'amim, the Midbar Ha'amim, which is the wilderness of the nations. 
And so when we were subjugated to a nation, we became like them. And then we were like, okay, that's, that's an excuse. Well, we were slaves, so we couldn't help it. And then we went and became our, our in the wilderness with just us and Hashem. And we, we messed up. And then we went to our own country, and now we're surrounded by the nations, and we don't have any excuses. We have, we're in charge. And what happened? We wanted to become like the nations. We have, there was like this lust to become like the nations, to be, to, to, to be drawn after us. So the problem with us as Jews is that instead of being the influencer, we became the influencee. We allow people to influence us instead of us influencing other people. And it's interesting because the people today who follow the Messiah, I, say, I believe they have this propensity to want to continue to be like the nations. We want to have seeker-sensitive things. We want to have our culture be reflective. We want people who come in from the outside to feel comfortable. Now, obviously, we do too. We don't want anybody to come to this shul and feel uncomfortable. We want them to feel comfortable. We want them to feel welcome. We want them to be able to ask questions, fellowship, and so forth. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the idea that you want the culture of your religious community to be so similar to the culture of the, of the secular community that when people come, they don't really, there's, they don't feel any propensity to change. There's not like, hey, I feel just as comfortable here as I do at the rock concert. I feel just as comfortable here as I do at the, at the gym. I feel just as comfortable here as I do at the mall. None of those things are necessarily evil in and of themselves. It just means that there's no cultural transformation. There's no cultural change. And the reality is, is that Torah requires cultural transformation. It requires cultural change. There are choices, and sometimes the choices are hard. And there's no easy solution. And, and listen, sometimes these choices are so challenging that people choose the world over God. Let me give an example. People would say, well, you know, I really want to be a Jew. I really see that this is the, the, this is the one true faith. And with not, we believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, so there's no need to leave Yeshua. And it's the most Jewish thing you can do. But my son, he really likes football. And, you know, the games are on Friday night. Rabbi, what can I do about that? I love it when people come to me and say, Rabbi, what can I do? You think it's okay for me to go to the game on Friday night? It's almost like they're wanting me to say, of course it's okay. It's a football after all. This is Texas. Now, listen, I'm a native Texan, and I like football. I love football. It's really the only sport I care about, actually, personally. It's just me. doesn't mean any other sport's bad. Just I like football. I like the aggression of it. No, I'm just kidding. No, not kidding. I'm not kidding. But, no, I, I enjoy football. I like it. I love it. Want some more of it. Would I go to a football game on Friday? No. Friday night. Would I go to a football game on Shabbat? No. Because I love football. Yes, I like it. It's a great game. But I, do I love it more than Hashem? No. Would I, would I, would I say to Hashem, you know, I'm going to go? Because, see, it, 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 when you do things like that, that's when it starts to become like an idol. And, and you say, well, it's not fair. How come they don't have other games on Sunday and so forth? Well, they will, but you have to become a professional first. You know, it's not fair. Life is not fair. But we could go over a thousand things that are like that, but you have to make choices. And it's, it's not fair. Why is the liquor store closed on Sunday and open on Shabbat? That's not fair. You're supposed to laugh at that, but it's kind of true, right? We can't go buy kosher wine from the liquor store on Sunday because it's closed. But they all drink. They're just pretending they don't. It's a joke. So what does it mean to sanctify the name of God? It goes on to say here in this introduction that Knesset Israel became the sole bearer of the divine truth and it can never escape its destiny. So here's the, here's the grace of God. People be, say they believe in a grace message, but they really don't. Because in their, in their message, Hashem had a people called Israel 
we kept messing up, and then we did not recognize the Messiah, although it's not exactly true because tens of thousands of people of Jews did, but putting that aside, And as a result, that particular gospel teaches that God jettisoned his Israel people and took upon himself a new people who became the spiritual Israel. And they call that grace. But let me tell you the real grace message. Hashem chose a people, and regardless of all their mistakes, he stuck with that people And even though they kept failing him, he didn't fail them. They were unfaithful, but he was faithful. And he said, I chose you for a reason, and I'm going to choose you now, and I'm going to choose you to the last. And he said that you can't escape your destiny. And even though you keep messing up, you keep making teshuva, and I keep forgiving you. And in the end of days, divine revelation, divine consciousness, divine truth will come through you and no one else because I chose you. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a real grace message. The real grace message is when God chose you and then you mess up and you stand before the Lord and you say, well, I guess you're done with me now because you chose me, but I completely blew it. And he says, you don't think I'm the God who sees the end from the beginning? You don't think I'm the God who saw what you were going to do the day I chose you? You think that I'm so stupid and foolish that I can't see that you were going to make a mistake? No, I chose you because of the mistake because I knew you would say, please forgive me. That's grace. Grace is not when you screw up, God jettisons you and picks somebody else. That's not grace. Grace is built into Torah. And so the reality is, is that Israel will be the ones through whom truth comes. Let that sink in. Now, chapter 20 opens up and says this. It happened on the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that men from among the elders of Israel came to seek an answer from Adonai, and they sat in front of me. Then the word of Adonai came to me, saying, Ben Adam, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus spoke my Lord Hashem Elohim. Is it to seek of me that you have come? As I live, I will not make myself accessible to you. The words of my Lord Hashem Elohim. Would you rebuke them? Would you rebuke them, Ben Adam, of the abominations of their fathers? Inform them. And say to them, so said my Lord Hashem Elohim, on the day of my choice. I want you to pay attention to the wording here because We're not going to spend a lot of time. I'm not going to do a deep dive into this, but I want to make reference. Please forgive me for doing so, but I'm going to make reference to a false teaching, one of the many, of Paul from the book of Galatians. And I want you to pay attention because where I'm reading right now refutes him and the Word of God disagrees with Paul on many things, but this is one of them, okay? Okay. So it says, so said my Lord Hashem Elohim, on the day of my choice of Israel, when I swore to the seed, say seed, of Jacob's family and made myself known to them in Egypt, then I swore to them saying, I am Adonai, your God. This is a complete and total just refutation of Paul. It completely destroys his, his, his gospel, which he said was his gospel. Let me, I'm not going to do a deep dive here, but let me explain. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, Paul is making an argument. He's juxtapositioning two covenants. Now, listen, I want to be very sensitive. I'm trying to be the kinder, gentler rabbi. I'm working on it. My doctor has really helped me, okay? And I should say the medication's kicking in too, Okay. Yeah. Hannah's hand and nose of the medication is my wife. <laughs> but look, I understand. I, I, I'm, I am totally sympathetic to people who really have a lot of admiration for Paul. 
because you don't and you don't know this. I know this because I've taken the red pill and I can see the matrix now. Okay. The church has been making an idol out of Paul for about 1,600 years. I've had people tell me that because I deny Paul, I will not go to heaven. I believe in Yeshua. I believe in Hashem. I believe in the Word of God. I believe in all of that. But if I reject Paul, I'm done. What does that tell you? Not one person told me. Dozens of people have said that to me. Dozens of Christians. Why? Because Paul is the guy. Okay, so listen, I'm sensitive to this, okay? I'm sensitive and I get it. And if you're not there yet, I totally get it. You think Paul is true. You think, no, no, Rabbi, you're wrong. I'm not wrong, trust me. I've been doing this since last week. No, I've been doing this for like 30 years. I've been to Bible college, got the plaque on the wall. I'm a, I was an ordained pastor at one time in my life. I'm not ashamed of that. That actually was a very helpful path because I understand. I sympathize. I used to think Paul was amazing. But he's a heretic. Okay? And I said all that. That was a big lead up to this. Paul might have been a Jew by birth, but he knows nothing of Jews and Judaism. I'm telling you this as a very, please hear me, as a very, very well educated rabbi, a, a practicing Orthodox Jew who knows a lot about Jews and Judaism, and Paul doesn't know anything, okay? Paul here is making a, a dichotomy between the covenant of Sinai, which is, by the way, the covenant. How many of you ever seen Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark? How many arcs were they searching for? I'm sorry, how many? One. What was it called? The Ark of the covenant. It wasn't called the Ark of those covenants, was it? No. And listen, what else do you need besides Indiana Jones? I mean, come on. Anyway, it's the Ark of the covenant, right? Because why? There's one covenant. By the way, I don't have a Tehillim. Who has a Tehillim? Who has a Tehillim? Boba Vakasha. Besefer Tehillim. <laughs> Thank you for this precious gift. <laughs> so, um, anyway, there's one covenant, okay? So he's making a dichotomy saying the covenant of Sinai is a, is a one that kind of, the covenant of Sinai came in at a certain time and went out at a certain time. He's referencing another covenant that was more, more uh, the eternal covenant, which is the promise that God made to Abraham, and Abraham said, I believe God, and, and therefore it's, it's faith, the covenant of faith, okay? That's what he's saying. And so he says, I'm trying to figure out what I need to do first here, but let me read this first. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though this is Galatians 3, 15 through 17. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is not only man's covenant, yet, yet, it, if, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. I have no idea what he's trying to say there. That's totally, that's the significance of the passage of time. It says here, verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Listen. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. He's quoting here from the book of Genesis. In this Ark is the Torah. We brought it out earlier. What's the first book of the Torah? Genesis. So he's saying that the law came 430 years later, 
as he's quoting from the law. Genesis is the book of the law. And in the book of the law of Genesis is this story about Avram. Avram. And so he's saying that 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 covenant that came later does not annul the covenant that came here. He doesn't know anything he's talking about. Let me explain something to you from last night. We read Psalm 111, because Psalm 111 is the the Tehillim of Parashah Maseh. And it says... Uh, let's see, where is it? Um, it was 11, wasn't it? Ah, verse 9. Tehillim 111, 9. You put that on the screen there. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant for Ever, holy and awesome is his name. I'm sorry. Can we read this again? Pardon me for one second. Bedut shalosh l'ami ziva olam, Breto kadosh ve'nora shemo, Shalach le'amo ziva le'olam. He commanded his covenant, Brito, ziva le'olam, Brito, Ziva, he commanded, Le'olam forever, Brito, his covenant. Ladies and gentlemen, what this says is that the covenant that God gave at Mount Sinai is a covenant that he, Ziva, commanded Le'olam forever. Okay? Now, I didn't mean to go that deep in the Galatians. My wife is laughing. She does, yes, she did, yeah. But anyway, we're going to go back to this, okay? So he's trying to say here in Galatians that the seed is Christ. Now, I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. He absolutely is. Yeshua renewed the covenant for us. He absolutely did. But Yeshua is not the seed. How do we know? Because Ezekiel just told us who the seed is. The seed is Israel. Ezekiel just said the seed is Israel. See, Paul's argument is the seed is not Israel. It's Christ. But Ezekiel said, Paul, you're wrong. Now, I ask you a question. You be the judge. If you have Paul and you have Ezekiel, who are you going to listen to? Paul says the seed is Christ. Ezekiel says, lo, lo shema, Shaul. The seed is Knesset Israel. If you're standing in front of Ezekiel, you have Ezekiel on the witness stand, then later you have Paul or switch him, who cares? Which one are you going to believe? Ezekiel, of course. Of course you're going to believe Ezekiel. Now, let's go back to this introduction. It says, and it happened on the seventh year and the fifth month, on the tenth of the month, that men from among the elders of Israel came to seek out an answer from Hashem, and they sat in front of me. This is Ezekiel talking. What's interesting about this is that this occurred on the tenth of Av, which is, you have the ninth of Av, which is Tisha B'Av. We're going, that's, that's week after next. We're going to have that as a fast day as we, as we mourn the temple. That's when the destructions began to occur, but the, the actual destruction destruction occurred the next day on the 10th of Av, which is why some say that we should carry on over our mourning into the 10th of Av. But what God is saying here in this chapter is that four years from now, this temple is going to be destroyed, right? That's what they're saying. But basically, this is occurring on the 10th of Av is what I really want to tell you. Now, what it's saying here is that also in the Midrash Rabbah to uh, um, Shira Sharim, it says that these elders who came to Ezekiel were Haniel, Mishael, and Azariah. They came to ask him a question. Okay? Now, I want to say one quick thing here. This is just a little passing side note because in this particular section of the Midrash Rabbah, it's talking about what brought the annihilation decree upon the Jews during the times of Esther. And one of, how many of you have ever heard that it's okay to eat whatever you want to eat? 
How many of you have ever heard that you can even eat food that's been offered to an idol? Don't ask, don't tell. You know, who cares? Has it been offered to a demon? Yes, it has. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. Well, it says here in the Midrash Rabbah that it brings down that one of the reasons why the decree was made, why Haman was allowed to rise up, is because the Jews, during that entire year-long festival of Ahasuerus, were eating the food that he cooked and had offered to his gods. So who are you going to believe? I'm going to suggest maybe you don't want to, you don't want to snack on it. So anyway, listen, this is the Midrash Rabbah. This is the story. Hananiah, 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 Mishael, and Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah went to Daniel to seek his advice. They said to him, our teacher Daniel Nebuchadnezzar has erected a statue and designated three representatives from each of the, in, in every nation to come and bow to it. And he des- designated the three of us to represent everybody from Israel. What do you say to us? Shall we bow to it or not? Now, not that they were going to go bow to it, but they're asking Daniel for his advice. Daniel answered them and said, Behold, the prophet Ezekiel stands before you. Go and ask him. See, Daniel and Ezekiel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were all contemporaries. Ezekiel was in Babylon with everybody else. So they went to go ask the prophet Ezekiel. They went immediately to Ezekiel and said to him, as they had said to Daniel, shall we bow down to the statue or not? Ezekiel answered them and said, I've already received a tradition from my father, my teacher, the prophet Isaiah, regarding cases such as this. He said in Isaiah 26, 20, hide for a brief moment until the wrath is passed. Accordingly, you should run away and hide. They said to him, but what do you want people saying, that all the nations bow down to this statue? What, it, what they were saying here was, if we run and hide, the people may not realize that we don't stand among the nations, and therefore they will assume that we too bowed along with everyone else. And therefore, because we bowed, Israel bowed. Ezekiel asked them, says, so what do you, so what do you purpose? They replied, we want to degrade the statue by being there and not bowing down so that the people will say, of all the nations who bowed to the statue, Israel did not. Will God perform a miracle for us and save us? Ezekiel said to them, if such is your intention, wait for me and I will go and consult the Almighty. Thus it is written, some men of the elders of Israel came to inquire of Hashem, and they, they sat before me, Ezekiel 20 and verse 1. And who were they? They were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who had come to Ezekiel and asked him to inquire of God regarding their dilemma. Ezekiel said before Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Master of the universe, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, wish to give their lives for the sanctification of your name. Will you stand over them to protect them or not? God thus spoke unto Ezekiel, I will not. I will not stand over them to protect them. I want you to, I want to repeat what I just said. God said, I will not. Thus it is written subsequently that God said, Ezekiel, son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, is it to inquire of me that you have come? Verse 3, chapter 20, book of Ezekiel. God was saying, after you, that is the entire generation of Jews. You've caused me to destroy my temple, burn my sanctuary, and exile my children among the nations. After all of that, you come to acquire to me. And the verse says, as I live, I swear, I will not relate to your in- in- inquiries. That is to say, I will, as it says in the verse we just read, I will not save you. At that moment, Ezekiel wept. He lamented and wailed to himself, saying, Woe to the enemies of Israel, the remnant of Judah is lost. Why did he say this? Because he assumed that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah would all be slain, and they were the only righteous people of Judah left. So it says, For there is nothing remaining of Judah. And it says, For the four of them were from Judah, and he knew that they would be slain. He cried as he went to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to give them the message. And as soon as he came to him, they asked him, What did Hakadosh Baruch Hu say to you? He answered them and said, He will not stand over you to protect you. 
They replied to him, Well, whether he stands over us or does not stand over us, we shall give our lives to sanctify his name. You may know that this is so, kind reader, for it says, Before before they had come to Ezekiel, what did they say to Nebuchadnezzar when he threatened them with a fiery furnace? They said, We are not going to worship, and we're not worried about replying to you about this matter. Behold, our God, whom we worship, is able to save us. He will rescue us from the fiery burning furnace and from your hand, O king. And once they had returned from speaking to Ezekiel, what did they say to Nebuchadnezzar? They said to him, but if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, we will not bow down to your statue. Whether he saves us or not does not save us. Let it be known to you that we shall not bow and prostrate ourselves. After they had left Ezekiel's presence, the spirit of the Lord appeared unto Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, what do you think, that I would not stand over them to protect them? I will certainly stand over them to protect them. Thus it is written, thus says the Lord Hashem Elohim, with this also I will relate to the inquiries of the house of Israel, Ezekiel 36, 37. However, leave them in the dark and do not tell them a thing. I shall leave them to go in, in I shall leave them to go in innocence thus it is written he who walks in innocence will walk about secretly Now let me explain what this midrash is teaching us here You might be thinking to yourself this is extremely confusing They go to Ezekiel the prophet and say we don't want to bow down to this statue we're not going to but we're wanting to know will Hashem save us Hashem says to Ezekiel I will not save them they think it through and say, well, we're going to die anyway. We're going to give our lives to sanctify the name of Hashem anyway. They were so committed not to betraying the Torah, to betraying God, that they didn't care if that meant they would be, die a horrible death in, the, in a fiery furnace. So they went off. As soon as they leave, Hashem appears to Ezekiel again and says, did you think I'm not going to save them? But let them go off in innocence. What, is, what, what was the test? It was a test. What was the test? The test was, are you willing to give your life because you know I'll save you? Or are you willing to give your life because you don't think I'm going to save you? That was a test. Because had God said, surely I'll save them, then, okay, I won't bow down to your statue because God is going to save me. Okay, no problem. But when God says, I won't save you, and yet they went off to sanctify his name anyway. That's the power of the Jewish soul towards Torah. People wonder why Jews won't abandon the Torah. This is why. And as soon as they left, as soon as they left to go confront Nebuchadnezzar and not bow down, God shows back up to Ezekiel and says, by the way, I'm going to save them. I just wanted to see what they were going to do. The story goes on to say that there, are, there were several miracles that happened that day. There were seven, in fact. One of them was on that very day, Ezekiel left the presence of the Lord, and he went to the valley of dry bones and raised those dry bones up to be a, a great army. Also on that day, the angel in charge of, of ice, hail, came before Hakadosh Baku and said, Oh, Lord, shall I go and save them and quench the fire? And the Lord said, no, because if you do that, then some may say it was a natural event. So he called forth the angel who's the prince of fire. Who do you think that is? Memtet, Yeshua. He called the angel who's in charge of fire, and he said, go and save them and make the fire seven times hotter. It should burn everything and be super intense, but not burn them. In other words, he saved the fire with fire. That's why Nebuchadnezzar says, did we not throw three in? And yet I see four, like one like the Son of Man. So he went there, and he, that's why the flame burned everything. It even burned the ropes on their hands, but it didn't so much as cause smoke smell to be on their clothing. And that's how God saved Mishael, Mish, Haniel, Mishael, and Azariah. Azariah, Azariah because they were committed to following the Torah of Hashem. 
The book of Ezekiel goes on to say, I'm just going to continue reading here from verse 6. On that day I swore to them to take them out from the land of Egypt to the land which I had sought out for them, flowing with milk and honey, a splendor for all the lands. And I said to them, every man cast away the idols of his eyes with the idols of Egypt. Do not defile yourself. I am Adonai, your God. And they rebelled against me and did not want to listen to me. No man, the idols of their eyes, they did not cast out the idols of Egypt. They did not forsake. And I intended to pour my fury upon them to spend my anger upon them in the midst of the land, but I acted for the sake of my name that if it not be destroyed in the eyes of the nations midst, which they are in whose sight I have been made made myself known to them to remove them from the land of Egypt. Now, I want to pause here and just reference something else I had read in the Midrash uh, section shortly after this story of Hananiah um, uh, and, and Azariah and Mishael and say that there was a great addiction to idolatry, to idol worship. It still exists today. You're, you're going to see, by the way, in these, in these end times, I don't, I don't know if the end times are 100 years long now or whatever they are. It could be, could be two years, could be a year, could be six months, who knows. But you're going to see more and more people return to the gods of Egypt and the gods of Rome and the gods of Greece openly, openly. You know, uh, I was just reading because I, I everybody saw the Olympics thing. You should, if you didn't, like it's interesting because it's been every, all over everything. That was an open tribute to the Greek god of wine and theater. It's unbelievable on a national stage. And I came across something uh, just the other day. I was looking into some of this kind of stuff. And, of course, we, we know, we see today that homosexuality and transgender is being pushed. You know, it's been made cool. And what's also being pushed right now, you may not realize it, is pedophilia. It's being pushed. And I came across, I was looking at a, Britan- a, a Britannica reference. I was just looking at some things. Did you know that, and look, look I'm not saying anything about a movie, good or bad. I mean, it is, it's fantasy, but, you know, there was a movie, the, the Narnia movie, and they had the, one of the characters, the good characters was Pan. Again, I'm not saying bad or good about the movie. I'm just pointing this out, that that, that was put out there years ago. And Pan, I read it in this Britannica reference, of it, one of his issues was pedophilia. And Odin, the father of Thor, there is, there's a book that's been written by a, a person who studies that culture, and, and she's suggesting that one of his issues is that he was um, homosexual. There, he brings down some things about that. The Viking warrior god. And you say, Rabbi, why are you bringing this up? Guys, it's, and then, and then the, the Olympics has this display. These are not unrelated events. These are people who are coming home to their roots. The question is, is where is your home? Is your home with them or with God? So people are coming back and they're saying, they're saying, I don't want idolatry. There's people who are hooked on idolatry. And this is what, you know, we talk about Torah. We talk about tough decisions that have to be made. And I mean, you know, it's a real bummer that we just can't eat anywhere we want to. That's a real bummer. I like to eat. My wife knows. She's trying to get me to eat less. And I am. I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm prophesying, speaking, I'm speaking into, into existence. But, like, I like to eat, you know, and you just can't just go in anywhere and eat. You know, you've got to make choices. And is that easy? Is that fun? Is that great? No, it's not. I wish, I wish all the restaurants were kosher, okay, especially the Vietnamese ones. I wish they were all kosher, but they're not. It is what it is. You've got to make hard choices. 
You got you to gotta pack a lunch a lot of times when you travel and things of that nature. And so, um, you know, but what it's saying here is you cannot forsake the Torah, and that's what these three did. They did not forsake the Torah. I want to continue reading here because there's, there's this verse I wanted to get to because it's mentioned three different times. Look at verse 10. It says, And I took them out of the land of Egypt and brought them to the wilderness, verse 11, and gave them my decrees and my ordinances I made known to them, which, if a man performs them, he shall live through them. Ezekiel says this three times in this chapter. God is speaking, right? He says it here in verse 11. He says it again in verse 13. And he says it again in verse 21. Three times God says, if you will keep them, you will live through them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are people today and probably in this room who would say, well, you know, the Torah can't save you. And I want to tell you something right now. That's a holdover from Christianity. And it's wrong. You know who else said that the Torah can save you? Yeshua. In Luke chapter 10, he says, he's asked by somebody, what, what I need to do to inherit eternal life? Yeshua says, what's the law say? The, the man says, well, he quotes the Shema. And Yeshua says, that's right, do that and you'll live. And he walks away. And the man says, wait, 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 wait. Who's my neighbor? Oh, okay, that's another question. Okay, let's, let's have that conversation. But at no point did Yeshua ever say that the law can't save you. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, and I understand, because you've been mentally conditioned, Chinese water torture. The law can't save you. Can't, can't get saved by your deeds. Can't get saved by the law. That's ridiculous nonsense. What's the law? The law is the word of God. If I said to you, do you believe the word of God can save you? You wouldn't say no. That's absurd. Of course it can. If I believe the word of God, I'll be saved. Of course you will. Yeshua is the word of God made flesh. Is he the atonement offering? Yes, but we've talked about this. On a micro level, he's the one who renews the covenant. But the word of God does save. You know how I know that? Because that's what the word of God says. It says it here in Ezekiel, but it also says in places like Psalm 119, Psalm 19, and other places. We read in Psalm 111, it's the eternal covenant. It brings life. Of course it brings life. That's why we pray scripture over people when they're sick. Why? Because we think it saves them. Right? If the law doesn't have power to save them, why don't you read Mad Magazine over them? <laughs> or whatever, you know, or, you know, the tale of two cities or whatever. I mean, what do you just. <laughs> but, but, but look in verse 16 in, verse, in chapter 20. We're almost, we're almost, we're getting to the end. I'm not going not, not gonna to keep it so much longer, but I would say it says here in verse 16. Because my ordinances they spurned, and as for my decrees, they did not walk in them. My Sabbaths they desecrated because their idols, their idol goes to their heart. Now, I want to say about idolatry, what I was going to say about the, the insight here. You have to understand that these people that are going after idolatry and false gods and false religions, and there's a bunch of them, there's, that's because there's a power there, ladies and gentlemen. They're not, they, there's a benefit there. There's a story that says Nebuchadnezzar wanted to impress Daniel to bow down to a statue. So he took Daniel to the statue and he said, Daniel, I want you to bow down to the statue. I want you to see how powerful my statue is. So Nebuchadnezzar had taken the gold head plate from the high priest that says, Kedosh Ladonai, and had put it on the head of the idol. And the idol opened its mouth when Daniel came before it, and the idol said, Daniel, bow before me. Behold, I am Hashem. 
Now, I talked about this last year when I talked about the idol of Micah. Did the same thing, remember? What does this mean? Is that Hashem? Of course not. But remember the golden calf, they said, behold, this is your God, Hashem. So a lot of people are trying to say, well, the idol, it's Hashem. This is what happens when people keep festivals that aren't of God. And they say, well, you know, it doesn't matter. We're worshiping Hashem. Why? Because it's a golden calf. It's, the idol is Hashem. It's not. It's a, de- it's a demon. It's a demon. Demons can appear to us like they're angels of light on roads, like when we're going to Damascus. So how do you know? Yaakov, how do we know? How can we tell if it's a God, an angel of truth or not? How do we know? Well, because, you know, so-and-so says he's a good guy, so therefore we should listen to him. No, how do we know? Because what the angel teaches has to comport with what God said. So if the angel says the, the, the eternal covenant has been annulled, we know that's a lie. Why? Because God said it would never be annulled. That's how we know. Look, one final thing I'm going to talk about this morning. The idea is sanctifying the name of God. And how do we sanctify the name of God? We, ha- we have fidelity to his covenant. What's his covenant? The covenant is Torah. And we should take an example from these three who, even though they thought they were going to die, God said to them, they went to the prophet, you understand, and the prophet said, I, God said he's not going to save you. And they said, well, that's okay. That's okay. We're going to sanctify his name anyway. Be thrown into a fiery furnace. Now, I, want to, I don't want to be, I, I understand everybody's, well, listen, it's, it's, I want to be sensitive, but I also want to be kind of like, Get in your grill. These guys are willing to be thrown in a fiery furnace so they won't bow down to an idol. And you can't, you can't become a Jew and stop going to Friday night football? These guys are going to have their flesh melted off their skin, they think. Remember, they went to the, the, the prophet. The prophet told them, God said, I'm not going to help you. They're going to be melted down. And you can't pass by the restaurant because it's not kosher? It's just too hard for you? You can't live a Jewish life. It's just too too hard. It's too tough. That's weak. That's pathetic. Who's your God, really, I wonder? You know, we say things all the time like, well, God is my little one, man, and I'll... Yeshua said, hey, if you don't hate your father and mother, you're, you don't hate your spouse. He's not saying you have to hate them. He's just saying that who, if you don't love me more than them, then where, where are you really? And you have to ask yourself that. Where am I really? Like, why don't I want to do this? There's a lot of people who don't want to become a Jew because, I mean, even in the Jewish world, it doesn't have Yeshua yet. There, there, there are still people over there like, well, I don't want to become Jewish because I'd have all those other laws I'd have to follow. As if there's two covenants. But, but I'm thinking, like, wait, wait, what? Like, that's your, you don't, can you imagine standing before Hashem? Why didn't you follow me? Why didn't you embrace my covenant? Well, you know, there was, a, you just asked me a lot of stuff to do, and I just didn't have time. I had that thing, you know. I mean, really. So Hashem goes on, and I, this, is, this is the end. Hashem goes on in, in, in chapter 20 and verse 25. He makes a very strange comment, and I've had a couple of Christians confront me on this because, um, to be fair, they're kind of loony, these people. And they were trying, they were very blasphemous, and they were trying to say that the Torah is basically evil, okay? And to prove it, they pointed to this verse. Of course, they don't read anything else because you'll understand a lot of people like to take verses out of context. We will never do that here. We never do that here. In order to prepare for this message, I read this entire chapter and all the commentary. I will never take a verse out of context. That is so dangerous. But they said, see, let me tell you why your Torah is is, is bad or whatever. Verse 25, "So so I too gave them decrees which were not good and ordinances through which they could not live. 
Now, they said, see, God gave, a, God gave you guys a law that was not good and through which you couldn't live. See, this proves our point. My reply to that is, did you not read the whole chapter where God kept saying that the law he gave us, if we do it, we'd live through it? So what is God schizophrenic? On one hand, he's saying that the law is good and we'll live through it. On the other hand, he's saying that it's not good. By the way, this is the only verse in the entire Tanakh that says that. All the other ones say the law is amazing. So what's he talking about? Is he talking about his Torah? Of course not. He's talking about two things. A, I gave them over to their evil inclination. And B, I gave them over to the laws of the goyim. The, the, the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, that there's no, there's no middle road. You're either going to follow God and his laws or you'll be turned over to the evil one and you'll be forced to follow his laws. And they're not good laws, and you can't live by them. So we have to, we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we committed to? What, I mean, think about all the people who, think about all the people, all the Jews before us who died terrible deaths because they would not refuse the Torah of Hashem. And here we are, you might, people watching online, I, I totally understand. I mean, I get it. I get it. You live in, in two bunk ten somewhere, and the only kosher thing you can get is Manischewitz. I, I understand. I feel for you. Move to Texas. I, I totally, Saginaw, hashtag Saginaw. I totally get it. Okay? But. Anybody tying you to a stake and setting you on fire? Come on. You know, we can suck it up a little bit. You might have to order in your kosher wine. That's the, that's the, biggest, that's the biggest travail you're going to go through. Right? Am I right? So let's, let's understand what we're committed to. And it's all about sanctifying Hashem's name. And for people who are wondering, should I become Jewish or not? Let me ask you. Do you worship the God of the Jews? Is your Messiah, Jewish Messiah? Is the book that you're holding written in Hebrew? When you die and go to heaven, are you going to go to Jerusalem? Go ahead and sign up now and get ahead of the game. Hashem, thank you, Father, for your blessed word. B'Shem Yeshua, amen.